We are in the ninth week of our 10-week series on God's top 10, the Ten Commandments. We've tried to take a different look at these Ten Commandments all the way through. Exodus chapter 20, verse 16, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You may be seated. Father God, thank you for this day. And we ask that you would open our hearts for what you want to speak to us this day. And Father God, I especially ask that you would remind us this day of the plan and purpose that you have for our lives, the way that you want us to be a part of your work to change this world and the role that truth-telling has as a part of that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I was preparing for this message, um, this story came to mind, um, so I want to share it with you. Uh, a few months back, I had the opportunity to take my daughters to the Exploratorium. They actually happen to be in the front row here right now, Lily and Serena. Um, I'll applaud them. Uh, they bring great joy to my life. Uh, at the time, Lily was nine, Serena was six. We were spending the day together. And uh, the Exploratorium is now one of my favorite museums. And there's one exhibit that was particularly fascinating. And the exhibit was all about the capacity for people to be able to deceive. So the way that this exhibit works is that there are two people. You sit across from each other. And one person is sitting down and they have a screen in front of them. And their job is to look at the screen. And five times on the screen, there's a poker hand that will come up. So a five-card hand of a standard playing deck. So the hand comes up, and the person needs to look at it, and then look at the other person and say, I have no aces. Now, the cards that come up are preset. So they're, they're scrambled, but in four of the, the four of the hands that come up, there are no aces in them. And then one of the five that come up, one of the five hands, there are four aces in them. So one of the five times when the hands come up, the person sitting there needs to see it, see the aces, and then look at the other person and say, I have no aces. And the whole point of the exhibit is for the person who's sitting on this side to try to figure out, can I tell when that person is lying? So I'm a curious father. I think, oh, I, I really want to try this with my girls. I figure it's a good experiment. It'll prepare me for the years ahead. I get some clues a little bit right now about what, you know, teenage years might be like. So I start with my daughter, Lily. Nine years old, she sits down. And the first time through, I actually don't get it right because she's like smiling and squirming. And every time she smiles a little bit. But by the second time and third time, I have it nailed. I can tell when it comes up. She has a kind of particular smile. She squirms a little bit. I can tell when the aces come up and when she's trying to deceive me. So then I say, OK, Serena, now it's your turn. Let's give it a shot. So Serena sits down, looks at the screen. First hand pops up. She looks at me. I have no aces. 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 Stone cold <laughs> poker face. Now, in my head, I'm starting to panic. And I'm thinking ahead. I'm thinking, OK, if this is what it's like now, what am I going to do when she gets older and she becomes a teenager and I am in serious trouble? So I look at her and I say, Serena, I can't tell. You, look, you said that and looked exactly the same all five times. And Serena looks at me and she says, Daddy, what are aces? <laughs> so I learned two things really fast. The first is it's really easy to lie when you don't know that you're lying. <laughs> the second thing that really drove home through that experience was it's a scary thing when you don't know whether someone is telling you the truth when you can't tell if someone is being honest with you. 
So for me, I was thinking ahead, and I was thinking about, you know, when I'm trusting what Serena is going to be saying around, yes, I finished my homework, around, you know, yes, I'm a safe driver, or yes, I'm just going to a friend's house. There are a lot of things that I'm going to be relying on her statements over the years, and if I don't have confidence that what she's telling me is the truth, that's a really scary thing. And it also made me think that the reverse is true as well. You know, when our kids can't rely on whether or not they can trust the things that I say to them. So if I say, you know, I'm going to be there for you, I'm going to pick you up after school, or I'm going to be at that performance or at that game, and if they learn over time that, you know what, when my dad says those things, I really don't know whether it's going to happen or not, that can be a scary place for a kid. And some of us can resonate with this, um, you know, maybe in our workplaces. You're thinking, you know, that's the situation that I'm in at work. When I think about my coworkers, when I think about the executives at my company, or when I think about the employees that report to me, I've learned that they say things and I can't trust it. And it leads to feeling like, you know, betrayal. It's, it leads to feeling insecure. And ultimately, it can lead just to feeling totally cynical about the, the environment. We learn, you know, everyone is just in it for themselves, and maybe that's what I got to do also. The same dynamic can be present in our relationships. And actually, the closer the relationship, the higher the stakes. If you think about friends, if you think about family, if you think about dating, if you think about marriage, when we're in close relationships and we learn that we can't trust the words that the other person is saying, it undermines, destroys the very foundation of the relationship. And we can't move forward with intimacy, with joy, unless there's something that can restore trust in that relationship. So that's the context that brings us to this ninth commandment. As we've talked about all through this series, these 10 commandments aren't just arbitrary rules. They aren't just, you know, 10 things that God set up for people to jump through. But God gives them in a particular context. He has set the people of Israel free from slavery in Egypt. And as he's brought them now, now he said, I am your God. You are my people. And he gives these 10 commandments as he's forming these people into a nation. And he's basically saying, these are the commands that I am giving to you so that you will thrive, so that you will flourish, so that you will never return back into slavery, but you will be established forever. And we've gone through the other eight commandments to get to this point. I'm not going to give you a quiz, um, but there have no other gods before me. Don't make idols. Don't misuse God's name. Remember the Sabbath. Honor your mother and father. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. And don't steal. And I think God was wise enough, realistic enough, to know that sometimes these commands were going to be broken. And human nature, being what it is, when we break rules, we tend to lie about it and try to cover it up. So <clears throat> just imagine, you're an Israelite, you raise goats, and one day you realize that one of your goats is missing. And so you wander around, you go over to your neighbor's pasture, and you see a goat there that looks remarkably like the goat that is missing now in your neighbor's pasture. And so you go over and you talk to your neighbor and you say, hey, you know, I'm missing a goat. And that goat right there looks just like the one that's missing. Now, what do you do if your neighbor says, oh, that goat, that goat is one that my uncle gave me four years ago. I've had that goat a long time. And, but thank you for letting me know that you're missing a goat. Um, and it looks like that one. I'll keep my eye out for it. Let me pray for you. I hope you find it. Um, I'm sure it'll be okay. What do you do? What do you do if you're not sure if that neighbor is telling the truth? What do you do if it starts to happen over and over again? Either at some point the neighbor is going to need to tell the truth and you're going to need to trust it, or at some point a witness is going to have to come forward 
And the witness is going to have to say, you know, I either saw that neighbor take that goat or, you know, actually I know the uncle and that neighbor and it really is a goat that just looks like an identical twin, right? The challenge is if there's no way to separate truth from lies, there's no way to pierce through deception or dishonesty, then lawlessness reigns. Then you have chaos. You have every person able to, to only look out for themselves and for their own interest, and a community can fall apart. And so God added this ninth command, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. And the principle that's implicit in this command is that only truth can bring restoration can bring accountability, can bring healing when wrong has been done. So if there's a person in the community who has committed murder or who has stolen something, the only thing that can hold that person accountable is if a witness comes forward and speaks truthfully about what has been done. And the worst case scenario I mean, if that doesn't happen, if no witnesses come forward, then that person can continue to move forward with impunity. They can get away with all kinds of things. And then the worst case scenario is if there are witnesses, but they can be bought off or paid off. And so, you know, some um, poor, honest person gets roped into being accused instead, and the false witnesses say, oh yeah, that was the guy who did it. And then you have a community where it's just all about power and control, and what you can get away with. So in the context here, this ninth commandment really declares that truth-telling is the instrument of justice and healing. It's the only thing that can hold the guilty accountable and ensure that the innocent are protected. So that's the context of this verse uh, here in Exodus. And so I want to look at a couple of things about, well, what does that mean for us here today? So I want to talk about for two big implications. The first implication that I want to, um, to look at is that this isn't limited just to the legal system. So it's not just if you get subpoenaed and brought into federal court and you have to give testimony. So what scripture makes clear, Old Testament, New Testament, is that this principle about the importance of truth-telling extends to every aspect of life. It extends to our financial dealings. It extends to our relationships. It extends to how we treat the people around us, our neighbors. That truth-telling is essential for our world to be a world that God intended, a world where people can be treated with goodness and with honesty and can flourish. And if the opposite is occurring, if there's dishonesty and deception that's occurring, then the opposite of what God intends will happen, which is harm and pain and suffering. So let me run through some of these really, real quick um, so that you have a sense of what Scripture is saying. So Proverbs 12.22 says, The Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in people who are trustworthy. Leviticus 19.35, around business dealings, it says, Do not use dishonest standards when measuring length, weight, or quantity. So if you're making a transaction and you're measuring with the scale, don't use a weight that's heavier or lighter than it should be and defraud the person. Deuteronomy 25, 16, for the Lord your God detests anyone who deals dishonestly. Or Ephesians 4, 25, that says each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, neighbor, anyone who's around you. Zechariah 8, which tells us to speak the truth to one another. Ephesians 4.15, which teaches us to speak the truth in love. And John 8, where Jesus says, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. All these verses, just a reflection of God's heart and the importance of truthfulness in creating a world, creating environments where people can flourish. So this last verse leads us to a second important point. Um, and that is that speaking truth is part of our calling. It's part of us fulfilling God's plan and purpose for our lives to 
contribute to the health of communities and help to redeem this world and to orient this world so that it reflects the way that God intended. And I want to spend a moment because I really want to wrestle with this honestly because I think this is a hard point for us to grapple with sometimes. We are surrounded by a culture where deception is commonplace. One of the um, things I read just in, as I was researching for the sermon is that we, in, we, are, we encounter over 200 lies every day through media, through advertising, through people. And this is an election year, so I'm assuming that number is even higher than that, right? And I imagine that as someone hears, you know, truth-telling is instrumental to this world being the way that God intended, I imagine that, you know, someone here is thinking, you know, you really don't know what my workplace is like. You don't know how toxic it is. You don't know how devious people are, how backstabbing people are, and how everyone is really in it only for their own gain. And if I don't watch my back, and if I'm not willing to manipulate the truth in the way that other people manipulate the truth, I won't survive in what I'm doing. And someone else might say, you know, that view that truth-telling is necessary to fulfill God's purposes, that view just sounds naive. Do you know how politics works? There, there isn't a candidate that can get elected right now by telling the truth. Do you know how business works? I mean, sure, you have things like Enron and the mortgage crisis, but even if they get caught and they get exposed publicly, this is how people make their millions. This is just the way that the world works. Do you know how sports work? You know, sure, we have these examples of you know, Lance Armstrong and Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens being exposed and caught for taking performance-enhancing drugs in these really public ways. But at least they had their moment of glory. And, you know, for each of them that got caught, there are probably dozens of people that were never caught. And maybe some of us even think, you know, there's that old saying, if you aren't cheating, you aren't trying. That's just the way the world works. And as we wrestle with these real environments in our life, you know, I think part of what it makes us do is we try to kind of rationalize and get space from what God is teaching about truth-telling. You know, it's one of the reasons why maybe we come up with these hypotheticals to reduce the impact of this command. So we think, well, you know, what about the exceptions to this rule where you have to lie to save a life? What what about if you're that person in, you know, 1930s, 1940s Germany, and, and you end up hiding a Jewish family, and the Gestapo comes to your door and knocks on your door and interrogates you and says, are you hiding Jews in your home? Do you have, you know, it, do you have to tell the truth then? And we raise these scenarios in our mind that says, well, you know, maybe we can escape from this a little bit. Now, it is true. It's not like Truth-telling is the only command in Scripture. And there are actually stories in Scripture where deception is done for a greater purpose, to save a life. Uh, you have Rahab protecting the spies in Jericho. Um, you have the Hebrew midwives deceiving the Egyptian authorities in order to spare the lives of Hebrew babies that are being born. And that these things are approved by God because there is a greater interest at work. But we got to be honest, when we struggle with truth, how many times is it really to save a life? And the reality is, even in these stories, what we see is it takes incredible moral courage to be in that scenario where you are standing against evil and trying to preserve life and deception is required. And the reality is God actually wants to create that level of courage and that level of conviction in us. He wants us to be people like the people who harbored Jews in World War II, like the people that are willing to stand up to despots and tyrants and to be able to speak truth. But in order to develop that level of moral conviction and courage to be able to change the world in those ways as God intends for us to do, we have to be developing muscles of integrity and trustworthiness and faith in God. And one of the ways that is lived out on a day-to-day -day basis 
is through truth-telling, being willing to tell the truth, being willing to deal with the consequences that come from that. And so God says there's a choice that each one of us has. We can be cynical. We can say, you know, this is just the way that the world works. And I'm going to play this game too because it's the only way to watch my back and get ahead. And when we do that, we contribute to, poison, to a poisonous, toxic environment that distorts the character of God, that distorts the goodness of God's creation that he intended. And we inflict, we're a part of the system that inflicts pain on untold numbers of people. So it's true, like when the mortgage crisis hit in 2008, 2009, 2010, yeah, there were hundreds, thousands of people that made millions through that process, leading up to it, after it. You know, they may have lied and deceived and gotten away with it. But as a result of their actions, tens, hundreds of millions of people around the world lost homes, lost jobs, the unemployment rose, and when the unemployment rises, people, the, the death rate rises, that there was unimaginable harm that is caused in the ecosystem of the world because of deceit and deception. You can see the same dynamic that comes in, in athletics, right? When some athletes start using performance-enhancing drugs, when some athletes start juicing, the ones that suffer most are actually the ones that are trying to stay clean. And suddenly, if you're a borderline athlete, you're not sure whether you're going to be able to make it anymore. Maybe you lose a starting position. Maybe you're not able to fulfill that dream and have that job. And you suffer, your family suffers because other people are deceiving and dishonest and getting ahead. And God says that this is not the world that he intended. And he calls all people, but especially his people, people that are called by his name, people that would say, I am a follower of Jesus. He calls his people to live in a different way in order to change the world. So let me summarize this second point like this. It is impossible to fulfill our God-given purpose without being courageous truth-tellers. So what does this actually look like? How do we live this out? Because I think if we think about it, we know that it's actually incredibly difficult, that we face tension and challenges in all sorts of areas of our lives. And in fact, God gives us a principle on how to live it out, but he actually lives it out for us so we can see what courageous truth-telling looks like. And it's captured in this verse, that describes what Jesus' ministry in this world was all about. John chapter 1, verse 14 says, Jesus, the Word, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. We are called, like Jesus, to engage this world with grace and truth. These two things that oftentimes can feel like opposites, but when they are bound together, have incredible power to change and transform this world. And it's not easy, because the reality is, for many of us, we tend to kind of lean one way or the other between grace and truth. So there may be some people here, and I count myself one of them, that we tend to lean towards grace instead of truth. So if someone does something that offends us, we're more likely just to stuff it down, to not say anything, because we're thinking about, well, I don't want the other person to be embarrassed. I don't want to really raise an unpleasant topic with them, so I'm just going to hold it in. Grace, not truth. You know, this attitude, kind of people like us that lean grace, not truth, probably the reason why we have so many kind of kids' sports leagues and baseball and t-ball and soccer where we don't keep score. Everybody wins. Everybody gets a trophy at the end because we don't want people to feel like they're winners and losers, and so we lean towards grace, not truth. 
Uh, the first girl I ever dated in high school, I had a crush on her for about two weeks. And uh, in those two weeks, we kind of started going out. And then I realized, you know, that feeling isn't there anymore, and I want to take a step back. But I didn't feel comfortable just having a conversation with her and letting her know that. And so I ended up just not calling her and avoiding her. And my hope was, well, maybe she'll get interested in someone else and just start dating someone else and the problem will be solved. And in my immature kind of high school world, I was trying to lean towards grace, not truth. But the problem is, grace without truth isn't really grace. It's not actually kind or beneficial to people to withhold truth from them. When someone offends us and we don't let them know, a lot of times we hold it inside anyway. And it actually affects our relationship with them. And we, when we aren't truthful about how something made us feel or how something bothered us, it doesn't give that person an opportunity to learn from what happened, to maybe grow through it, maybe to acknowledge what offended us. It doesn't give the two of us an opportunity to address the issue and move forward with our relationship. And a lot of times, the relationship just gets damaged, and we just move on. Grace without truth, the impact of grace without truth. You know, when we create situations where all kids are winners, and they never get exposed to loss, and if they, if they move forward in life thinking that all of life is that way, then we do them a great disservice if they go into life not recognizing that there's going to be hardship and struggle and adversity and failure that they're going to have to contend with and that they're going to have to figure out how to deal with it when someone actually does win and they are not that winner. And it can seem, and to be honest, there's some things that we call grace that ultimately are really just us being chicken. Right? Like lacking courage to address things head on. And that was certainly the situation with me and that girl where eventually she had to corner me and say, look, what is going on? And we had a painful and awkward conversation that would have gone a lot better and a lot easier if I had just been willing to address the situation honestly at the right time. So that's what happens when we lean towards grace at the expense of truth. That grace without truth isn't really grace. But the opposite is true as well. There are some people here that know you are a, you're someone who speaks truth, that there's not a single person in your sphere that doesn't know exactly what you think about them and about every other topic that you care to expound on. You walk through life giving people a piece of your mind and you might not have that much to hold on to, but you're going to give people a piece of your mind anyway. But the reality is, because you really don't care what other people think, you really don't care about how people actually receive the things that you say, that if you're really honest and you look back over the course of your life, in your wake are littered people and relationships that are broken and offended and hurt and wounded, because of your commitment to truth that has nothing to do with grace. And so just like grace without truth isn't really grace, truth without grace isn't really truth. And we see this most of all in the person of Jesus. Jesus says, I didn't come to condemn this world, and that condemnation could have been done with all truth. But Jesus says, I came to save the world. And when Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, that part of who, who Jesus is as truth is representing the Father's heart to extend grace and love and mercy and forgiveness to all people. He's saying that at the very heartbeat of God's truth is grace. And if we represent truth without that grace, we really aren't representing God at all. So this is the challenge, conveying grace and truth 
as we engage with other people, as we engage with the world. But in order to do this, in order to really be able to engage with grace and truth, the first person that we need to extend this grace and truth to, the maybe the hardest person, is really ourselves. Our challenge with truthfulness generally comes with something that is broken or twisted or wounded inside of us. So as I was thinking about this sermon, I kind of had to do an inventory of my own struggles with truthfulness. And one of the first stories that came to mind uh, that still sticks with me is um, out of middle school. So I was in seventh grade. I had to take an art class. I'm not a good artist. I'm actually tremendously insecure about my capabilities as an artist. But I was a good student. I was an A student, and it meant incredibly a lot to me to keep my A average and to get an A in the class. And so the way that this class worked is at the end of the quarter, I needed to come up with a list of all the assignments that I had done, and then I sit down with the teacher, I walk through the list, and then she gives me a grade. So I had done a number of different projects. Uh, most of them I'd done on my own. And there was one project in the class that was just beautiful that I had nothing to do with. Um, a number of people in the class had uh, worked on this giant mural of the magic school bus. And they had, they had done all sorts of things to this mural. They painted it yellow and all these other colors. Um, there were all these different parts that people had worked on, painting and drawing and sketching and all these different things to it. it and it, was, it had a prominent place in the room. And so I come up with my list, and I'm sitting down with the teacher, walking through the assignments that I've done. And when I get to the end, there's something in me that just slips in, and I worked on the magic school bus. And someone else in the class overheard what I said and looked right at me and said, you're a liar. You did not work on the magic school bus. Now I'm like frozen. <laughs> and I couldn't imagine acknowledging that I had just lied in front of the teacher and the consequences that that would bring. So I doubled down on it. I said, no, no, you know, that, that part of the back of the school bus, uh, I, I, I touched it up a little bit, you know, like I did a little. Now, the teacher really didn't want to get in the middle of it and try to figure out who was lying or who was not. But I'll never forget what the other kid said to me. He looked at me and just said, you're a liar. Is that how you get the good grades that you get? By lying. I've carried that with me 30 years. <laughs> so what are, what are the reasons why we lie? I think it's actually quite simple. We lie to benefit ourselves, right? I wanted that A. I thought that lie would help me to get that A that I wanted. We lie to cover up our weaknesses or insecurities. I didn't lie or have to lie in those other classes that I was taking. I wasn't insecure about it. But in art class, I knew how poor of an artist I was, and I wanted that extra little benefit in order to get what I wanted. And then we lie to avoid embarrassment, shame, or punishment. Why did I double down at that lie at the end? Because I didn't want the embarrassment, shame, and punishment of being exposed in front of the teacher. So all those elements are in the story that I just shared. But all of these elements are really in every big lie that we can be aware of in media. I mean, think about athletes and performance-enhancing drugs. Why are they doing it? They're doing it for benefit. Maybe they're doing it because they think everyone else is doing it, and how am I going to keep up if I'm not also gaining this advantage? And then why, when it's so clear to everyone that the evidence is there, that they, they lied and they used these drugs, they're sitting in front of congressional testimony, and they're still saying, no, I've never used performance-enhancing drugs. Why? Because they're so bought in, and their whole family, their friends, the, everyone that they care about thinks that they are honest and trustworthy and they've achieved their milestones because of their own prowess and in order to avoid embarrassment or shame or punishment, they continue to lie and they can't let go. You can see these dynamics in just about every other area. So 
I was thinking about a way to illustrate this dynamic. What's really going on when we're tied into lies in this way? So I'll, I ran this idea by my wife. She uh, voted for it, so I'm going to give it a try. So when we lie, we're trying to shape how people think about us, right? A lie is something that we're trying to get someone else to believe that isn't true. And when it's about us, we're trying to get people to believe something about us, to see us in a way that isn't true. Sometimes we want to see ourselves in a way that isn't true. So one of the ways, one of the ways to look at what's actually happening is it's like we have someone that we desperately want to be. Okay? This is the ideal form of me. We're about the same height. We got about the same muscles. <laughs> Ethnicity is a little bit tricky, but, but I want to be Superman to the people that care about me the most. I want to be bulletproof like this guy is. I want people to think of me and to think, yeah, Tilden is honest. Tilden is trustworthy. Tilden is always there when you need him. Tilden won't let you down. Tilden is caring and compassionate and good and powerful and gracious and kind and worthy of respect and honor and admiration. All of these things that we all desperately long for. And the reality is when we fall short, it's painful to deal with the reality that we are not the person that we want to be or we hope other people see us as. And it's easy to deceive and to hide behind this image so that people continue to see the person that we really want them to see. So we touch Superman up so that people see what we want them to see. It can happen in a workplace when we don't take responsibility for things that we really did wrong or we give a false impression, right? I'm, I was so busy that day, I'm sorry that I wasn't able to respond to your email. Who said that? <laughs> Were we really that busy that day? Sometimes it's true, sometimes it's not. But we want people to see something in particular. And even in church context, we can want people to think that we are kinder, more generous, more holy, more prayerful than we really are. Because we want people to see us in a particular way. We can actually get away with this for some period of time. A lot of the time. But at some point... There's, a, there's always a cost to deception. And the cost comes when we engage with other people and we can't really be ourselves. We're hiding behind this image. We're touching it up, hoping that this is all they'll see. But the ultimate cost comes in our relationship with God. Because God really does have x-ray vision. He can see through these images that we put together. But when we know that God sees us, we can't deal with it. So we duck and dodge and hold this up. And when God draws near to us to get to know us, to build relationship, we pull farther and farther away from God so that he can't see what we really look like. And what God is calling us to do is to be able to lay this image down and to just be able to come before God as we really are with all of our strengths and weaknesses, with all of our brokenness and wounds. This is what repentance looks like. This is repentance, to lay down all the false justifications and rationalizations and the false impressions and everything that we're trying to offer to other people and to come before God and just to say, God, I desperately need you as I am. And when we do that, we encounter the grace and truth of God. And the grace and truth of God is ultimately most displayed on the cross. As Jesus hung on the cross, the truth of the cross says, you know, for every deception, for every brokenness, for all the ways that other people were harmed when you lied, for the, the damage that you caused, for the people that were disadvantaged, for the pain in relationships, all of that has a price. But that's why I'm hanging on the cross pouring out my life for you. And the grace of the cross says, because of my love for you, I will forgive you and heal you and enfold you in relationship 
and I will change you from the inside out and give you what you need to live the life that I intend for you to live. I will pour my love into you. And it's when we engage with the grace and truth of Jesus, first for ourselves, then we are able to be able to engage with the world with grace and truth to others. Because if God has poured out all of his riches, if he's forgiven me and he's given me what I most want, to be fully known and fully loved, to know that my life is hidden with his no matter what, he will never leave me or forsake me, then I don't have to chase the small benefits of this world. And even when grace and truth result in sacrifice or consequence or cost, I can do that and I can accept God's invitation to be a part of the redemptive work that he's doing in this world. Amen. And I don't have to try to cover over, you know, resurrect Superman and paint him over. I don't have to try to cover over my weaknesses or limitations because I know that Scripture says that in my weakness, I am strong, that his grace is sufficient in my weakness. And so I know that whatever I'm lacking, God is going to provide everything that I need in order to do what he's calling me to do in my life. And I know that I don't need to deceive or be dishonest in order to hide from shame or embarrassment or punishment or what other people think. Because Jesus has taken all the shame and punishment and embarrassment and he has paid that price on the cross. And so I can be honest with him and honest with other people and as I engage with other people with grace and truth, truth means that I don't let things slide that dishonor who God is and dishonor God's best for people. But when I engage with people, I'm not just slinging condemnation around. I'm genuinely thinking about their good and their best. And I'm thinking about how the timing of when I speak, the manner in which I speak, in order to express God's deepest love to the people around me. And through that, I and we become instruments of God's grace and transformation in this world. We become world changers so that people can encounter and see that there is a different way to live in this world. And it comes from the heart of God, full of grace and truth. So I want to end just with two very practical things. If there's something that God has spoken to you in this message and you want to take a next step forward, I want to encourage you to do two things. The first thing is I want to encourage you to find someone in your life that you can share grace and truth with and that can speak grace and truth to you. So, you know, in church circles, a lot of times this is called an accountability partner uh, in recovery circles, this is often called a sponsor, but really we're just talking about someone who is a good and trusted friend that you can be holy yourself to, not have to hide anything to, and you know that they're going to speak grace and truth into your life. Because as much as we want to have that with God and just have that with everyone, it's incredibly hard to cultivate that and to grow in that unless we really have someone alongside of us that we're practicing that with. It's one of the reasons why we put so much into our life groups. And I want to be honest, our life groups are going through a little bit of a transition. Uh, we're trying to hire for a new pastor, director of life groups. Um, some of our life groups uh, don't meet kind of consistently in the summer. So um, I want to encourage you, if you've thought about being a part of a life group, I know, because I hear the stories, I know that there are people that are able to find these kinds of relationships in our life groups. And I want, if you've tried to sign up and you've had a hard time making a match, I want to encourage you, don't give up. Keep trying. Um, you know, by the summer, or by the fall, we, we are committed to trying to find a place for you where you can develop these kinds of relationships. And you might be someone that might think about, you know, I might be able to host or to lead one of these life groups. And if you'd like to um, offer yourself for consideration with that, you can facilitate that not only for yourself, but also for other people in the community. So if that's something that you might be interested in, just check off life groups on your connection card. 
But the second thing that I just want to leave as a practical step for all of us is to take part of this week and reflect on is there an area of your life or a relationship in your life where you're not being fully honest, where you're bringing a, a dishonest self. You're, bringing, you're hiding who you really are. You're contributing to greater distrust or less than transparency because of something that's going on with you in that situation or with that person. Maybe it's in a workplace. Maybe it's in a friendship. But I want to encourage you to think about that, to ask God to reveal it. And if God shows you that there is an area where you can take a step forward in bringing grace and truth into that place and helping people to encounter the real presence and love of God and where you can move forward in grace and truthfulness in yourself, that you would have the courage to take that next step forward. And if you're willing to do that, I would just um, encourage you to make that commitment before God and just write in, your, in the place where you can respond to the message, I will live with grace and truth and take that next step forward. Amen.